This is Kevin Fitzpatrick. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as President and CEO of Inform. And uh, again, thank you all for uh, participating with us today. Today, we're going to take on the, the very timely issue of maximizing your organization's digital impact, as we are all primarily the digital organizations at this point. Uh, we have two speakers today, uh, Mark Burrier and uh, Emily Kaiser. Uh, Mark Burrier, many of you know, he is uh, one of uh, the Inform leaders uh, since 2008. Mark has been the VP of D Design and Digital Strategy and has been Inform's go-to person for visual design, user research, and user experience testing. He really enjoys problem solving both from a business strategy standpoint and from a technical standpoint. Uh, you'll also see his handiwork in Inform's business analytics and marketing, such as when he's prototyping ideas and testing designs. We have the pleasure of being joined today by Emily Kaiser. Uh, Emily is stumbled into her first web design uh, strategy role during a college internship where she was supporting the rollout of the Department of Health and Human Services Y2K sites, which is something I think many of us will recall. It was a fortuitous turn of events, both because she discovered that pursuing her planned career in dramatic literature would likely prove incompatible with her continued desire to eat and find shelter. Uh, but she uh, found work that she loved. And uh, in the time since, she has written and produced content for national nonprofits, wrangled a global volunteer community, managed the search, search products for large tech companies, and led digital engagement strategy for major public media brands. Uh, once someone once made the mistake of hiring her, which I don't think it was a mistake actually, um, uh, as a designer. Currently, she's the director of digital strategy at the Society for Neuroscience, and we're very grateful for uh, Emily's participation uh, today. So with, uh, without further ado, and with our phones uh, uh, securely muted, I'm going to turn the, uh, the, the agenda over to uh, Mark Burrier. Mark? Thank you, Kevin, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. So as Kevin was mentioning, um, I have been working in the association space um, with Inform for over a decade now, and both from a design perspective and from a user research uh, one. And that really comes into play uh, as we talk about digital strategies, because uh, the two of those really go hand in hand. So our agenda for today, uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about our audience and from an association perspective, that's our membership, uh, some tactics that can be put into practice and how do we measure uh, those tactics so that we, we know we're getting the most return. And then finally, we'll conclude with sharing um, some experiences and there will be time at the end uh, that we hope to feel free to uh, chime in with questions as we uh, know a lot of us are uh, this is a very timely topic at this, this time. Uh, so for one, so just grounding us, what is digital strategy? This is actually a, a, a phrase that we're hearing more and more. It's in people's job titles now. It did not exist years ago. It's essentially um, just using the digital resources that you have uh, to, um, to uh, meet objectives, uh, very simply put. But the hardest part about it is maximizing the impact. So uh, it's, we all can be on, have websites and be on uh, social channels and, and, and essentially sending our message out to, into the abyss. Um, but the hardest part about uh, getting the biggest bang for your buck from this is if you don't know your members, that's really the first step. And I always kind of equate this to uh, not knowing your members is like buying someone a gift that you're, you, you don't know what they like. No one's really happy in that transaction. No one's really getting fulfilled. Um, we all know that uh, all of our lives have, have changed as a result of the, the pandemic worldwide and associations um, are not um, uh, unlike anyone else in that. Um, and especially uh, uh, looking for alternatives to, to on-site meetings and, and other delivery methods, um, looking to your digital properties and maximizing them is, is of the utmost importance. So a lot of what we're talking about today We'll be framing it in the, the, the scene that we're in now. So let's begin with talking about your audiences. And from a membership perspective, I like to look at uh, membership from a couple different angles. First, who are your members? And 
And what we see represented here of largely your member base is probably made up of a lot of people who are in the prime of their career, some just starting out, some um, nearing retirement. And depending on your association's focus, uh, the, the bucket of potential members um, out there uh, is it can be an unknown number or um, can be something that uh, you, you've been trying to, to penetrate for a very long time. Um, so uh, this is one commonality among membership organizations is that you'll see, you'll see breakdown, especially professional ones, you'll see breakdowns in this manner. Um, but we often talk uh, about generational um, guidelines for our members. So our, you know, how many millennial uh, members do you have, boomers, Gen X, et cetera. And uh, those terms often come with uh, some, some stereotypes. And one of the, the big stereotypes are that the, you know, the younger the member, uh, the more engaged they are digitally. Um, but I, I prefer to look at these things from a perspective of whether you're a digital native or an immigrant. And the, the thought here is that were you born with the internet and smartphones available, or is that something that you remember a time that did not exist? And I'm, I'm of the digital immigrant category. And as we can see here, there, there are subsets of these. Are the, uh, there are people who still avoid. There's some people who reluctantly adopt. Uh, there's enthusiastic adopters. And I think all of us uh, on this call um, can find ourselves in one of these buckets. But I think the, the, the thing that I find about, uh, you know, debunking, especially the digital natives aspect, is that there are still people who we consider to be the younger generation, the future members, um, just because they have an aptitude towards uh, digital um, delivery systems doesn't mean they want to participate with it in that way. So I think that is something to consider as we get to know our members. They, they are a little more nuanced than what we may want to believe. And then finally, the why are they your members? And this is something that all your, your membership departments um, uh, have probably are top of mind at all times, especially when you're thinking about member value and come renewal times. Um, what we're seeing represented here on this slide of, 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 especially for a professional organization, possible reasons as to why they maintain membership in your association. Um, over time, and as I think it's a trend that you're, you may be aware of, is that we're seeing less and less of a, I'm a member because of tradition. Um, my, my professor was a member, my, you know, my mentor was a member, and therefore I am. So we're seeing, we're seeing a little bit of this over time, and we're now uh, looking to view associations from a little bit more of a transactional experience. So if, I, if, I'm, a, if I'm a member, what do I get for that? Uh, is it a good value for me? Um, and so I think we're, we're, your, your potential members and your current ones can, reconsidering membership are thinking more in those terms nowadays. Where are your members is a great question to ask, both professionally and personally. And we can't forget the personal aspect. Um, one of the reasons is because their, their experiences with digital platforms uh, in their personal lives, whether it be a, a Netflix or listening to podcasts or reading, reading uh, online newspapers, um, that is driving their their behavior and their, their user experience. And from a, if a professional organization uh, doesn't look to those other consumer-based uh, digital properties for inspiration, there will be a disconnect. You, you, the, your, your members are getting expectations set for them as to what, what digital properties can do. So it's important to keep those in, in top of mind and, and to explore potential possibilities there. And, a, and at all costs, we want to avoid this mentality to resist change. Um, and I think that at the, is, is at the core of, of digital strategy as a, as a vocation. So let's talk about some tactics as to, we, we're getting to know our members. How can we get to know them? Um, my background is in design, and so therefore I, I tend to think of problem solving from a design perspective. And it could be designing for a web page. It could be designing a product. It doesn't matter. These steps of design thinking principles where 
you first need to understand and empathize with your user. Um, allow yourself time to, to ideate and to, to think of possible options, even crazy ones, to address these, these issues that may, you may find. And then a time to experiment, so to prototype and, and to test and, and iterate these ideas. Um, these are really the kind of the, the building blocks of, of being able to start to think a little differently about uh, member communication and, and the products that you're creating and delivering. So the first step that uh, we stress in anything is you need to conduct research. So before you can uh, create messages and, and communicate them to your, to your members, you need to really understand who your members are. And um, over the years, we've, I've helped a number of associations, you know, go on site to meetings, um, have phone interviews with interviews all over, inter, uh, members all over the world, and really getting to know them from a perspective of what is their relationship with your association? Uh, why are they a member? What do they feel is the value that you give? And how do they receive communication from you? And you'll get, uh, you know, a, a variety of, of answers. Um, I'm sure all of you conduct surveys and other, uh, you know, demographic information. Uh, oftentimes, different departments are, are conducting that research and not sharing with one another. So gathering all the information from recent years together and, and seeing if there are trends that can be identified at the very least, uh, making use of what is already in, in, in your organization. If you're not capturing your digital traffic, and what I mean by that is, is web statistics, so Google Analytics, um, how many people are visiting your pages and your apps and, and things like that. If you're not getting that information, which is largely free to, to do, um, you're, you're greatly missing out. And I feel like that's a, definitely a step one in, in better understanding how what you have from a digital perspective is actually performing. And then finally, from a dog fooding is another way of putting it, but using your, your platforms like how your members do. So do you, find, do you yourself find difficulty locating things on your own website or um, you know, not knowing where to go in order to um, find information? So uh, even that type of one-on-one -on -one research uh, on your own can expose um, pain points and, and help you empathize with your members. The next is because we're still talking digital here, your suite of technology services, whether it be what, what content management system that you have, how many websites you actually run, um, what social media channels are you on, do you send out member emails, if so, how and what platforms are they coming from, um, what are those services that you do in order, that you have in order to communicate to your members, and can they be tracked? Um, what we want to do here is identify, are there, are there channels that your particular membership responds really well to? Are there others that can be consolidated and, and, and removed? We want to look at usage trends over time. Um, one thing that you know, many of you may know, but from an a international perspective, I've, I've, myself I've seen over the years um, that uh, sometimes um, relying on a member to come to a website in order to receive that information is a much more passive exchange, but emailing them uh, delivers that information. And that's, you know, email is not a new thing, um, but it is something that, that may produce better results for your particular organization. So therefore you can uh, focus a little bit heavily on that. And then finally, new tools and technologies we've all heard about. Uh, new developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning. There are a number of products that are uh, coming onto the, the marketplace now. Um, are those products something that could save your, your members time and, and save you time and money and, and um, show um, that your, your organization is, is forward thinking to your membership? Digital strategy is uh, something that spans departments. Um, you need buy-in from leadership, uh, your memberships, your marketing, your meetings departments all need to be working hand-in-hand -hand with a unified voice 
and sending out messages and using the same platforms and tracking things in the, in the same way. So departmental alignment is key here. And um, setting a, a governance for um, communication and, and what platforms are used to communicate to which audiences, uh, those types of uh, rules that are able to give, give your staff guidance in order to better understand how to, um, how to communicate and how to uh, better effectively engage your members. Uh, I find that sometimes appointing an owner, whether that's a, a department, say, you know, the marketing department is in charge of this initiative or, or a single person, depending on your organizational structure, but someone needs to own the idea of digital strategy within your organization and own the reporting of analytics and be able to report to leadership uh, trends. Um, and not only gives, empowers uh, people on the staff uh, uh, for um, uh, that responsibility, but also allows it to not fall through the cracks because this is a long-term, it's not a, it's a long-term uh, solution. And um, finally, an advisory council of engaged members. And so this, if, uh, if we're asking for, to be a little bit better engaged with our members, um, at including them, um, building, we'll be talking a little bit further here about member affinity, but bringing them along for the ride as you try new things uh, will help build your brand in their eyes and um, uh, could give you better returns for retention in the future. And then finally, testing ideas. So don't be scared to run pilot programs, to try new things to try different versions of the same thing. For example, sending out communications uh, in two different voices or two different call to actions just to test which one works better. Um, there are a number of uh, ways to go about doing this, both low budget and, and very fancy. Um, but I think that's something that uh, um, I, I wanna stress the, of giving your programs some room to breathe. Pilot programs, depending on your audience and depending on how traditional your audience is can sometimes um, uh, take, take you know, up to a year, to six months to a year in order to gain a little bit of traction. So it's important to resist pulling the plug on those a little too soon. And how do we measure success? We, we put some of these tactics in place. Uh, we want to make sure that because data is at the core of your digital strategy, we want to make sure that data is used to, to, to measure this uh, the success of some of your initiatives. And some possible ways to look at this is um, ha revenue growth has expanded by X percent, um, membership numbers changing, increased visits to websites and other digital properties, lowering customer service calls. So have you improved your, your digital platform so much that your members no longer have trouble um, and no longer bother your customer service with uh, questions on how to use things or how to apply for something. So um, the, that can all be measured. Um, and then project debriefs. So internally, it's important to uh, these pilot programs and your communications to have regular check-ins on whatever team is in charge of this to uh, share your successes and, um, and, and possible failures for this, to, uh, things to learn from. Um, the more people know and the more that they're engaged, uh, the more that they'll buy into this from an organizational perspective. And then finally, some possible outcomes that we have. Uh, one thing that I really think is core to this is that uh, an organization, especially in today's climate, with a strong digital presence, that one that shows uh, um, confidence and uh, consolidation that um, I truly believe that will lead to member retention. They'll see, member, they'll see value in their membership um, and it could lead to new partnership opportunities um, from both sponsorship perspective and content sharing uh, as things we're, are looking at from a digital uh, perspective here. Um, and Again, your staff, the more data focused the staff is uh, about um, uh, judging as to whether something was successful or not and, and, uh, and, and making decisions about budgetary decisions um, based on, on real facts and figures um, is, is better, much better than gut instinct over time. And finally, using technology to decrease labor and increase insights um, 
for uh, letting technology work for you um, while we're while you're using the the intellectual capacity of your of your staff to be thinking for some new ideas and thinking of new ways rather than um, doing uh, you know rote tasks over and over and over again. So, which brings us to um, sharing of some some experiences, and um, I'm going to turn things over to Emily, um, and she has a case study to to share with you, with us all. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm really glad to be here today to talk about our case study on what we've called the Confronting COVID-19 initiative that we've been working on. So, first, a little bit of background. Uh, I work for the Society for Neuroscience, which represents about 30,000 uh, neuroscientists at all career levels from around the globe, many of whom are at this point uh, experiencing significant disruptions to both their research and to their academic work. So the challenge we were really dealing with here was how to authentically connect with our members. And we were cognizant of the need to be both visible and accessible and really uh, the, the Point Mark made about empathy here plays a huge role in this initiative as well. Um, we didn't want to look like we were taking advantage of this um, uh, of this time, uh, but we really wanted to make sure that we could demonstrate our value to them. So we spun up a, a cross-functional working group that includes um, our meetings and events staff, our professional development teams, marketing, advocacy, our scientific publications, basically anybody who interfaces with members at, at some point during the year. Um, and we've we've uh, been meeting on a regular basis to talk through um, this initiative and to, to um, continue our work on it. So the first thing that we really were looking at was the need to spin something up quickly. Things were happening so fast. This was about a month ago. So things were happening really fast and we needed to, to be in front of that to address it. So we decided we couldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here and we needed to get something out quickly. So we took our best educated guesses about what was needed at this time and we went ahead and went out the door with that and then we were able to iterate from there. So um, what did we actually do? So we created a dedicated space for COVID-19 resources, which is really kind of a fancy way of saying we made a landing page. Um, but we have a fall annual meeting and this is usually the time of the year when things pick up in earnest for that. But because we've had to make some changes already to our schedule, um, due to the fact that scientists aren't able to uh, um, access their work, we needed this to be a place that could provide news for the society's response. It also uh, needed to collect um, information about our schedule changes, and we wanted it to provide easy access to materials that were curated specifically to address the things that our members have told us that they're struggling with. So things like how to maintain mentor relationships um, it, it distance, how to transition to virtual learning, and a strong desire to fill time productively with scientific learning, both through um, journal content, but also through more formal professional development opportunities. All of the things that we, uh, that we identified and that our members were talking about were really uh, materials that are available to them year round, but they don't always get the, um, the level of awareness that we'd like them to. So this was an opportunity to help them see a little bit of daylight. It also offered us the opportunity to do some gentle messaging about the value of membership and renewals. Uh, once, we, once we had that, that page out the door, we, we kind of pivoted to uh, content marketing. And we knew that we needed to meet users where they are for this, because even more than usual, I think we all feel that our attention is pulled in lots of different directions right now. So we needed to be on social, on email, on, to have the presence on the web, wherever people were looking, we, we wanted them to be able to find this information there. We started um, basically to divide and conquer on this. So our marketing team took the lead on a series of, of weekly content um, resource roundup emails. Those are ongoing and each, each one highlights a different aspect of the, the materials that we have available um, through this curated, uh, curated landing page. So this week's, for example, will be on science writing strategy. We've done virtual learning and some other topics as well. And then my team, the digital strategy team, took the lead on um, all of the web pieces, as well as the uh, weekly social highlights that show the breadth and depth of resources that we have here as well. So how have we been doing with this? And uh, what are we doing next? Um, on a lot of, of kind of typical measures, our results such as site traffic, um, it really hasn't been a runaway success, to be honest. Um, but we think this is still a really worthwhile effort and we're continuing with it because we're seeing some above average engagement on social posts and, and um, in email. 
uh, even though we're not seeing that people are using a lot of the resources, they're giving us a lot of indication that they appreciate them. They may just be too overwhelmed to use them at this point. So we'll continue to monitor and watch our metrics to see what happens with that over time. But you know, this is the kind of thing where it's, it's good to watch it, but we don't feel like that's the most important thing, so we're not obsessing over it. Um, one thing that we have been doing uh, in, this, in this phase is really checking in closely with um, users through a series of quick surveys. We put these on our, our professional development focused site. We've sent them out through email and we're just literally asking users what they want right now. Um, and that's allowed us to validate some of the assumptions that we made back at the beginning, as well as to make some um, adjustments, both to add some additional content and also to just relabel in some cases things that um, could help people find them more easily. And I think this is a really great opportunity also to try new things. We have the opportunity to, to engage user, users in new ways right now. Um, and on our side, what we've been doing for us is some um, outside of the box social messaging. We're um, playing with the idea of being uh, using a slightly different voice, a little bit friendlier vo voice and more informal. And we've also created some Zoom backgrounds that we're going to be um, distributing out um, in recognition of the fact that we're all, uh, we're all in that world right now. So really this is, I think, an opportunity for us to play a long game in a way that we, we might not have been able to um, even just a few weeks ago. We're looking at the ways that we can learn, use this opportunity to learn now, so that later on when things go back to some version of, of normal, um, we have a better understanding of what our users need overall. Thank you, Emily. Well, thank you, Mark. I'm sorry. Oh, so thank you, Emily, and uh, I um, hand it back to Kevin. Thanks, Mark, and thank you, Emily. That was uh, that was great. Um, uh, a number of important points there, and I'm going to uh, ask for questions uh, from the audience. And, and uh, if while you're formulating a question, let me just um, start by asking um, about this permission to experiment now. And I thought, Emily, you made a really important point that um, you know this this. Um, pandemic has taken a lot of things away from us, but it's also it's also given us a few things. And one of the things I think to your point that it's given us is the permission is permission to to innovate, permission to try new things in you know in a way that perhaps we could not before. Can you speak a little bit more about this and uh, what it's like in your organization? Sure, I'm happy to do that. So I think um, for us, we have a, a fairly um, a fairly formal voice typically, and one of the things that I think all of us have experienced that we've heard both you know within the organization, but also that we've experienced within our own lives is that I think because we are all so distant, uh, being able to connect to each other has become even more important um, and more valued. And I think that that really is where a lot of these, um, where a lot of the, the experimentation that we're looking to do has come from. How can we find a new way to connect um, with, our, with our members? How can we find a new way to connect with each other? And how can we really kind of show our humanity in a different way than what we might have done um, in the past? Thank you. I'll unmute myself and then and then say again, uh, uh, thank you for that. And um, are, are there any questions from the audience? Hi, I had a question. Uh, it's actually for Emily. Um, I was just wondering, um, can you speak on your group strategy related to kind of your fall meeting and your plans for providing virtual content and, and maybe how you're planning on rolling it out? Uh, my group is in a similar situation with the fall meeting, and, and certainly uh, I think what we're all dealing with is just the reality that we don't have complete data to drive any decisions at this point. Um, and, you know, volunteer leaders who certainly would like to get information out to members. Yeah, it would definitely be uh, nice if we all had a little bit more clarity at this point on what the, what the fall is going to look like. Um, I think what we're doing at this point is basically, you know, just continuing to monitor all of the guidance that's coming out of the WHO and the CDC and um, taking that under advisement. So we don't really have anything, um, you know, no, no, no news to share at this point, um, but we're all continuing to, to look at that and, you know, to, to think about what, what various uh, options would look like. 
Great, thank you. Um, any, any further questions? Well, perhaps one more then, uh, and uh, in, in the time that we have remaining, um, you know, I'd like to ask uh, you to comment on the, the, the notion that um, uh, a bench scientist uh, or a, uh, a neurologist, uh, a, uh, an active uh, professional person isn't going to use Instagram and they're not going to use social media and they're not on Twitter and they're, and they're not on Facebook. And I, 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 I sometimes hear this when we're talking about digital strategies and um, and some of the social media platforms uh, tend to um, uh, to perhaps be dismissed uh, out of hand. And I just wanted to ask Mark and Emily to uh, comment on your your thoughts regarding. Or I can get I can start. The uh, one thing that we found through research with with members over the years, and this is uh, you know across you know science and healthcare associations, um, is that I do find. Um, age to be a determination. So along the lines of the point we were making before about digital natives versus immigrants. And I also find that um, depending on where you are in your career stage and your location in the world, um, in, in some cases there's some correlations that could be made where um, some newer technologies like, like Twitter and Slack and, and means of quick communication um, uh, there's an adoption level there um, among a younger audience and um, it connects people, connects your global members um, together, whereas uh, because they're on it, they can get on their phone. And so I do think that there is a, um, while one social network doesn't rule them all, um, and that, that makes the job of the communications department uh, uh, a little um, difficult in order to uh, have to maintain multiple channels. Um, I think it's, I think it definitely is, uh, they, all oh, the members are spread evenly. And I don't know if Emily feels a little different, but that's been my experience. Yeah, I think what we see is, you know, our, our primary, our primary channel for us really is Twitter. Um, I think uh, what, one thing that we're, we're looking a lot at right now is um, Instagram. Our users are there um, to a greater degree than we are. Uh, so we are um, trying to catch up with that and to look for some, some new ways that we can engage the people who we know are already there. Um, I think uh, one thing that's sort of interesting about this, I'll, I'll speak to an experience actually from a previous position, um, but I worked, um, I, I worked with a news organization uh, at the time when Snapchat was brand new, and uh, we had been looking for some ways to experiment with Snapchat. And the the group that stepped forward was a news organ was a was a fairly staid news organization. And um, we found that they had a huge audience there. Like they, they did fantastically well. I think we, we never expected that that was going to be the case even with an older audience. And I think um, the, this is a really good example of you know, places where, where experimentation and, and just offering people the opportunity sometimes yields um, some interesting insights into who's using, who's using platforms, um, especially in places where we might not think that that's the case. Um, one thing we've been looking at a, a, a bit over the last couple of weeks is TikTok. There's a huge uh, neuro, neuro, neuroscience community on TikTok. So, you know, we, we're not there right now, but there are definitely people who are there that we could engage with if we were. So, um, you know, lots of, uh, lots of just trial and, trial and error to find um, the right places there. Great, thanks, Emily. And again, that uh, back to the theme of uh, permission, permission to try new things now. And um, and some are going to be uh, uh, more successful than others, but that's what experimentation is is all about. Um, any other questions from the uh, from the audience? Well, hearing none, uh, and I think we're about out of time now. I want to thank Mark and Emily for uh, for this presentation today. Um, uh, we are now all digital first organizations. We were before this started. We certainly are even more uh, in the current state. And uh, the, the more we can share best practices to uh, drive member affinity, uh, to, um, uh, to drive our organizations, uh, the, uh, the better we'll be collectively uh, as associations. I think um, the um, authoritative uh, voice of uh, professional associations at this time has never been more important or more eagerly sought. So thank you all for your efforts on that behalf. And, and with that, 
uh, we will uh, conclude uh, today's webinar and look forward to seeing you next month uh, when we take on a different topic.